It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Rana Abu Ghanam, who flew all the way from, uh, from British Columbia. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the University uh, at the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, University of British Columbia. Um, she taught at Carleton University, the Canadian University in Dubai, and Birzeit University in Palestine. She is a registered architect in Palestine with a degree in architectural engineering and a master of history and theory of architecture from McGill University. Her doctoral research, which is officially completed, uh, focuses on encounter colonial practices in Palestine. Her recent co-edited Architectures of Hiding uh, book was uh, recently published by, by Routledge, which is uh, very exciting. So thank you, Rana, for taking the time to be with us um, this, this evening, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, PhD is submitted, not defended yet, so hopefully things go well. Uh, but one more thing, um, that book that Anwar just mentioned, Architectures of Hiding, actually Anwar has a chapter in that book. So if you guys are interested, I highly recommend you take a look at it. There's some really fantastic contributions in that book. Um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank you for Waterloo School of Architecture for inviting me to come in today and having the space to talk about my research and about Palestine in general. I'd like to start off with a uh, land acknowledgement. Um, again, just reiterating that we are situated on lands that have been colonized and have been extracted and used for years. There are lands that um, we, are, we identify ourselves here as settlers, and we need to be able to kind of understand our positionality on those lands as we talk about questions of politics, governance, and the, the question of architecture in those spaces. And it is this intentional acknowledgement that I give that I want to use to position myself, my work, and my research here um, on those colonized lands. So starting off with an introduction to myself. Again, my name is Rana Abu Ghanam. I identify as a first-generation settler of color on this land, and I'm a Palestinian architect, scholar, and educator. And as Anwar had mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at UBC. I want to start a little bit by talking about what field is to me and where field comes from for me. So field has always been Palestine, and field has always been home to me. For me, the field and my home are one, and my everyday personal experiences are part of my learning and my knowledge of my field. I have lived on this face of this earth for now around 34 years, 22 of which have been on Palestine. So Palestine has been a big part of my learning and of my knowledge and of my presence. I was born and raised in Palestine in a small town called Bejala, which is just um, next to the city of Bethlehem. I then did my undergraduate studies at the School of Architecture in Birzeit, uh, where I met Anwar in Ramallah. Some of my earliest understandings of space and how it's fabricated and manipulated by power structures and control has really been based on my day-to-day -day and uh, life experiences and personal living experiences in Palestine. Some of those experiences including, include having to cross an Israeli checkpoint, having to drive by the apartheid wall, which loops into the West Bank, or having to drive under a bridge that connects Israeli settlements together while disconnecting Palestinian land. Today, specifically, I want to talk to you about a specific place of a field that's very dear to my heart. It's a project and my research place for the past seven years. It's the, the research place that I've been doing my PhD on, and it's quite significant to myself. So this is the old city of Hebron, or Al Khalil. It's really kind of a place of my knowing and my learning that I've had for the past seven years. The city of Hebron is located just south of on the West Bank, about 30 kilometers from Jerusalem. It's known for its long-standing tradition of handicrafts, including glass blowing, leather work, and pottery making. Just at the eastern edge of the city, down in the valley, is the old city of Hebron, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world and the largest, and the largest old city in Palestine. The old city of Hebron, there are two main streets that we see that cross through the city. And what I'm trying to do now is just kind of give you a context of what the site is so you can get a bit of sense of why my field and my methods are what they are. So in the old city of Hebron, there's two main streets that cross. I'm going to try to point those out to you. The first one is the one that you see here in blue. That's the Al-Qasab Street, which is the street that kind of cuts through 
if you see this tight, um, uh, tight kind of uh, built up area, which is really kind of the core of the old, seat, the old city. And just next to it, there's this green, green street over here, which is Al-Shuhada Street. Al-Shuhada Street is also quite a significant street, which has been a path of uh, trade between old Jerusalem and a major artery through, uh, trade route throughout history. The old city of Hebron is also quite significant because it's believed to host the remains of Abraham or Ibrahim, who was the patriarch for all three Abrahamic religions. Here we're talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, so within the old city of Hebron, there's Al Ibrahimi Mosque, or the Tomb of the Patriarchs, where it's believed that Ibrahim and his wife Sarah, their two sons, their wives, and children are buried. Um, this complex hosts buildings that date back uh, to around a century AD. And Hebron's significant architectural heritage and legacy has made Hebron a UNESCO World Heritage Site in danger since 2017. So we see that it's also been kind of acknowledged as a significant heritage site generally within the world. But Hebron's religious importance also signifies something quite important, which is that it has intensified the Israeli colonial project in the old city that's a little bit different than any other of the, of the colonial projects that we see, whether in Palestine or specifically in the West Bank. So looking specifically in the West Bank, generally the settlements, the Israeli settlements live on the outskirts of Palestinian cities. Again, if we go back to a couple of photos ago, so this is a photo from Beit Jala. What you see is, this is me, oops, this is me taking the photo from a, a part of Beit Jala. And just in the background there, you start seeing one of the Israeli settlements. So they're a little bit kind of distant. But in the old city of Hebron, because of that religious significance, what we start seeing is that the Israeli settlements literally take place within the old city. What we'll start seeing is that the proximity is very intense and the relationships and the, and the power structures are very much visible, if you want to say. Um, so here we just see a fast kind of attempt of a map to see what is happening in the old city. So what you start seeing, this is the, again, the highly compacted section of the old city, al qasabi area. And what we see, those blue areas over here, those are the Israeli settlements that were created. What they've done is literally take over houses, old city houses, and, and change them and convert them into Israeli settlements. So we see typically two ways of settlements that have been created in the old city. One is whether through um, taking over a complete house or kind of an area to create a mushroom of, an, of, a, of a settlement, or taking up certain parts of a house or certain parts of an area, which what we start seeing sometimes is something like this, where literally on the lower floor, there's Palestinians living, they're trying to shield themselves with the blue tarp from the Israeli settlers that, li that literally live just on top. So you see here an Israeli settler that lives on top with their Israeli flag, really trying to kind of create a, a source of intimidation as well to, to the Palestinians who live there. I just want to as well kind of keep in mind that these processes of what we'll talk about division, land grab, violence, and control that's happening in the old city are not necessarily an anomaly within all of Palestine, right? We see them across of Palestine, across of the West Bank, quite significantly and quite, uh, um, quite uh, evidently in different places in, uh, in Palestine. What this has also led with that intensification of the, of, the, um, of the settler movement is that there's areas in the old city that have, been, have become completely inaccessible to Palestinians. The Israelis have limited Palestinian access. So one of the main routes, again, Al-Shuhada Street that I mentioned uh, just a while ago, has now been inaccessible to Palestinians. It's manned by the Israeli soldiers, and Palestinians are not allowed to cross that area. Uh, we can see all the red lines. All of those red areas are areas that are now inaccessible to Palestinians. What you start seeing in moments like that are elements of what I call colonial infrastructure which is really an infrastructure that really kind of signifies and, and, and solidifies the colonial project of division, of apartheid, of land grab. Whether it's what we see here, whether it's checkpoints that you have to cross, blockades that completely close areas, or what we call, in a way, ghost checkpoints, where you think you can cross through, but as soon as you want to cross through, you find a soldier popping by and saying, hey, show me your passport that shows that you're not Palestinian. All of those are limitations that, that, that kind of, in a way, signify the herbicide, the term herbicide that we've been hearing a lot. Literally, the killing of the sense of a city, that really the city is becoming this ghost town area currently. 
So just to signify, the city is currently now established under four different regions of control and of, of, of power uh, in terms of how Palestinians are allowed to access them and where they want to access them. To short, to, 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 for the sake of time, I just want to maybe emphasize one area, which is this area here in red. This is the area in red that, as I mentioned before, Palestinians are completely unallowed to access, whether uh, but Israeli settlers and foreigners are completely allowed to, to pass through. Um, so what we started seeing here is that there's actually houses and access points that Palestinians now can't access, their own houses they couldn't access, doors will, were welded shut by Israeli soldiers on Al-Shuhada Street, which meant that Palestinians who live on Al-Shuhada Street had to find innovative ways to move around the city, whether it's by finding a neighbor's house that they can pass by, or by what we see here is literally walking over roofs to be able to jump into your own house. These are kind of systems where the counter starts to exist, the counter colonial starts to exist, finding ways to be able to really uh, undermine the colonial project and its, and its limitations. But all in all, and you go, if you go into Shohada Street right now, Shohada Street has become a complete, a complete uh, ghost town uh, that is in really dire need of rehabilitation and, and restoration, but it is completely inaccessible to Palestinians, so they won't be, they're, they're not able to actually take care of it or restore it. It's the same case that happens in other places in, uh, around Al Shohada Street. As an example, this is the vegetable market that you see the shift that happened between 1990s to 2007. Just recently, um, it was also announced that the vegetable market will also now become a location where a new Israeli settlement is going to be built. Again, another iteration of, of, of um, settlement building and, and, and land take up. By 2007, there were around 304 Palestinian shops that were closed, and 40% of the homes that were on the street were forcibly emptied. So what we started seeing is that really, again, this idea of herbicide was happening in different ways where again, the idea of the killing of the sense of a city, the killing the sense of a home is becoming empty through terror, terror spaces, through ways of intimidation, but as well as ways of restriction and, and manipulation. So now that we have a bit of context of what's happening, what as a researcher, as a Palestinian researcher, am I able to do and how am I able to understand a site like that? And how can I understand with all those limitations and all those, um, all those restrictions that, that are given to us. Generally, as a researcher, even as a student, when you are given a new site to look at, when you have a new field to look at, the first thing you do, you look it up on Google Maps, trying to figure out what it is, how it looks like. Really, we use maps as researchers, as architects, as scholars, as a way to start understanding sites, and as, as a way to start understanding field. This is sometimes a really good uh, exercise but it's not, not necessarily the case in Palestine, where what we'll see is that most maps are actually being censored, are being blurred, and are being as well uh, erased. So I wanted to look at a couple of examples in Hebron, first in Palestine, but then in Hebron to understand what's happening more, uh, more specifically. So Palestinian aerial maps that are accessible to the wider public have been widely censored by the Israeli state, but as well its American counterpart through different uh, power structures and different actual laws. Specifically, the Kyle Benjamin Amendment, the KBA, that was passed in 1996, signified that, uh, again, not passed in the US, signified that any aerial maps that are going to be open to the, to the public that are taken by American companies need to be uh, at least of the same resolution or less resolution than maps that are taken by other organizations or other countries. So at that point, the KBA kind of argued that the, the, the quality of the maps that are sold beyond the US maps are usually at two meters per pixel, which means that Palestinian maps that are taken, that you see on Google Maps as an example, would be around two meters per pixel. That, mind you, is quite different to the maps that you see generally on Google Maps that are usually around one meter to, per pixel, even up to 0 0.4 meters per pixel. So we're saying really the resolution of the things that you're seeing are at least half worse, if not more, right? Double worse, or if not more. Um, so that really, oops, sorry, that really kind of affected how you can actually be able to access those, those images and what type of images you're able to, to gain. Uh, so, and while this is really specifically done for 
for uh, US companies. Most, um, most companies that we use to look at maps, which are typically either Google or Bing, usually use US satellites to be able to, or to share their, their maps. So what we end up saying is that most of those maps are always blurred, right? Because if, if you ever open Google, you'll notice most of the maps that you're getting are from Maxmar or Maxar, and Maxar's maps are all American maps. So everything you end up seeing is blurred. One example that I want to show here is this really kind of vivid example taken at the Rafah border just next to Gaza. Um, so I want to start off by acknowledging that this kind of image, started, I, I got this image or I learned about this image um, through the works of geographer Linda Kukovics, who in her writing the, um, a research paper called Art of War, Art of Resistance, Palestinian Counter Cartography on Google Earth. She notes that images that were taken in 2005 were relatively a low resolution, between 10 to 20 meters per pixel. And since 2007, that's when they went up to around the two meters per pixel. Recently, the Carl Benjamin Amendment has been edited to increase the pixelation and to, in, to, sorry, to increase the resolution. So what you're starting to see in Google Maps is sometimes a little bit higher resolution. However, from what I'm learning is that that resolution is still fluctuating, taking in point sometimes political issues, economic issues. So every time you try to see the map, the resolution still fluctuates quite a lot. But looking specifically here at the, at the Rafah image, I want you to kind of signify a couple of, image, a couple of things. What you're seeing at the top over here is on, or on the, on the left side is the side of the Egyptian border versus what you see here is the side of the Gazan border. And if you can see really kind of the shift that's happening in resolution between the images here and the images here, it's quite significant. Unfortunately, maybe you're not seeing it as well here with the image, but I just want to kind of pinpoint some, some things. What you can actually see quite clearly are buildings. If you zoom in, you can actually start seeing the, the trucks, that there's a bottleneck of trucks trying to enter the Gaza, uh, the Gaza border. And you can also start seeing even the specificity of different kind of small infrastructural things. As you shift to the other side, literally just across the border, you start seeing something completely different. Everything blurs, buildings become ambig ambiguous, and the landscape is quite blurry. That is the field that I'm dealing with, something that's very much harder to read and see on maps. So shifting specifically into Hebron, we see that the, in the city of Hebron, the level of censor, censorship is amplified by really manufacturing an alternative, what I would say mostly is really reality on these maps. So as you look at the, mark, at, at the landmarks to try to situate yourself, you see that most of the landmarks, so those that are highlighted in a circle, in the orange circle, are actually Israeli landmarks rather than Palestinian landmarks. Um, of them, and I want to just kind of show a couple. As, as an example, the Shabbat of Hebron. If you open the link of the landmark to see what's happening in Shabbat of Hebron, you learn of a site that leads us to uh, an institution that supports the Israeli occupation forces and the settlers who live there. Uh, as, as a website that says that Hebron is, and I quote, the, the city of the forefathers of the Jewish nation. And uh, by, by going into their website, you also see a quote by an Israeli soldier stating, his name is Avi, and he states, and I quote, Hebron is one of the toughest places to serve. Yet, thanks to Shabbat, I had a blast and also gained a spiritual connection to the city. These are the kind of the narratives that you see while you enter those Google Maps. This is the things you learn of Hebron while you enter the Google Maps. Really, other locations that we see here are very much also include, are also very much connected to the Israeli narrative. Beit Hadassah Visitor Center and the museum celebrates Jewish history. The Beit Ramano Yushvat Shavai Hefron uses the website to introduce you to Jewish sites and neighborhoods inside the city, ultimately really creating a very much Israeli-only narrative within the city. Palestinian sites, just to acknowledge a couple that exist, on the other hand, are very little. So here we see three. One of them is the mosque. The other one is the, um, the old city post office. And the last one is the only one that actually links to a website, which is the Women in Hebron Cooperative. You go to the website, and it's a cooperative done by women to learn tatris, or really to learn sewing. So it's a quite a different narrative that you see, and maybe not as, as kind of established or not as strong as well. What I want to also highlight is kind of the infrastructural changes that happen. So 
One of the things you also see looking at this map is bus stops. Assuming as any, as any human that you would be able to get to those bus stops and you would be able to use them. Those, however, are Israeli only, settler only bus stops. Palestinians are not allowed to use. Again, just to highlight, this is Al Shuhada Street, the street that's inaccessible to Palestinians. So again, what you're seeing on the map doesn't necessarily signify a Palestinian reality and what a Palestinian would be able to use. I want to also kind of highlight the name shift that's happening. Al Shuhada Street here is called David Helmish Street. A complete change of name, something which um, which uh, theorists, theorists on settler colonialism really identify as a process that happens with settler colonialism, that named or renaming, renaming to destroy, really destroying to rebuild, be able, being able to raise things to create a new narrative and a new history. Um, and this is really what we're starting to see here. If we turn on the actual uh, option to see the satellite view, again, we go into this very much blurred space that it's really hard to be able to read any of the spaces. So you notice while the boundaries of the old city are visible through changes in maybe building and urban density, as you enter specifically the old section in the old city, the spaces become increasingly harder to read with streets and buildings blurring into larger, uh, almost volumes that you can't discern and understand. The thick density of the map, coupled with its lack of clarity and distinction, really serves ultimately as a way to erase Palestinian existence and Palestinian inhabit inhabitants on the site. And finally, one last map I want to share with you is those aerial maps that you can commercially buy from commercial sources. So as we shift into those aerial maps, we also see that then here the level of censorship and, uh, uh, and, and obscurity still exists. So even though here you start seeing a little bit better some of the parts of the city. You can zoom in and get more clarity. What you start noticing are those areas here that are pixelated. And those areas that are pixelated are pixelated by the Israeli state. They decide what gets to be pixelated, considering it's a security concern. Again, maps that are hard to read, it's almost impossible to understand what's happening on the site. So, as a Palestinian who's doing research, but also as a Palestinian who's trying to understand their own country, but also just as a Palestinian, what are the things that we can do and how can we understand and work with those limitations? I quote a quote from Edward Said that I think is one of perhaps the most significant re readings that were really inspiring for me. And it says, the main task for Palestinians is to know and understand the overall map of the territories that the Israelis have been creating. And then devise concrete tactics of resistance. And the history of colonial invasion, Maps are always first drawn by the victors. Since maps are always instruments of conquest, once projected, they are then implemented. Geography is therefore the art of war, but can also be the art of resistance if there's a counter map and a counter strategy. And that's the idea where the counter really comes for me. What is the counter and how can we really embody the counter? In my work in Hebron, I focus on this notion of the counter as a conceptual and mobilizing framework. Um, in the old city. I see it as a response to colonial conditions and colonial limitations and actions which I call, again, the counter-colonial. They are counter-colonial tactics. These actions, I see them as grassroots, bottom-up actions that um, have constant practices and, and they are resisting through and beyond the ongoing colonial project. Understanding the colonial project, but as well trying to shift beyond its limitations. Doing my work in Hebron, I was also very much aware and keeping in my mind questions that are very similar to what uh, Linda Tawai Smith, uh, Mari, um, uh, uh, Mari, a scholar and professor of indigenous education, says in her book, uh, In Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in, uh, and Indigenous Peoples, where she says, and I quote, indigenous activists often ask in a variety of ways, whose research is it? Who owns it? Who in whose interest does it serve? Who will benefit from it? Who has, who has designed its questions and framed its scope? Who will carry it out? Who will write it up? How will, it, how, how will its results be disseminated? All of those are important questions to think about as you do research, considering and keeping in mind really the extractive kind of nature of research and the extractive nature generally of as well the colonial project. How do we make sure that our work is not extractive but really has an action of reciprocity and kind of an action of, 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 um, of gain for, for, 
for communities as well, um, it's quite important. So with that being said, my research in Hebron started with completely going almost kind of naively into the site and specifically working and, and, and volunteering for the HRC, the Hebron Rehabilitation Committee, a committee that was, um, that's been created in Hebron since 1996 as a way to defend Hebron and be able to maintain Hebron's livability to Palestinians considering all the issues and all the political strife that we just talked about. I was there really to be able to learn from and within the field, but also to make sure that my presence is beyond a form of knowledge extraction. So I really started working with the HRC in 2019 for six weeks, but my relationship since then, so almost now six years, almost four, five years, four years, five years, um, hasn't finished. And I still work with HRC. My relationship with them still continues to, to kind of grow. So really what I wanted to do is really to work with the site and literally work, do labor in the site that I can actually be able to offer my labor as a person to be able to help in the site as an act of reciprocity there. So while, while during those six weeks, I volunteered to help out with the UNESCO conservation and management plan that they were working at that point. And I also designed this playground for them, for the children in one of the most restricted areas in Hebron. Throughout this process, really my relationship with the site and the community continued to grow. This slow process of learning countered the abstract and blurred map that we just looked at, that really is generally also examined quite fastly and as well from afar, from a desktop somewhere in, in Canada. Um, really during my work with Hebron, I worked what, in what I saw on three main counter acts or acts of countering as a way to learn about the site. So what I'll introduce for you, to you next is, in a way, those three um, counteracts and what they are um, and how I kind of use them in my own work. Um, so for act one is inhabiting the blurred or really the photograph. As I worked with the HRC, I documented my daily walks through video recordings and photographs. Those images I took weren't necessarily research documents. They were literally just daily walks and documents. Every day, I had a habit. I would, first of all, take the, 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 the taxi or the kind of the communal's uh, big bus from Bethlehem into Hebron. The bus would drop me off in this kind of large uh, downtown part, and then I would walk all the way from the bus into one of the headquarters or HRC's headquarters. As I did that every day, I would turn on my phone and literally just hang it on my shoulder strap like that and walk. And what I was trying to do is just really be able to just learn about the site, document what I'm doing while I walk on the site, not necessarily intentionally documenting something, but just walking and learning of the things that I'm doing. So for six weeks, I did that every single day. And it wasn't just that walk, that was my first walk of the day. There were multiple walks that I did. And every time I would do a walk, I would take, I would take videos, I would take photographs. And it was really for me to be able to kind of learn about those experiences through those different, um, through those different videos and images. Stepping away from them and doing a bit of reflection on those videos, I was able to categorize for those into three different categories. The first images that I was able to kind of get from them are images that documented architectural heritage rehabilitation work, which was also some of the images I did to document for them. So it was really kind of a multiple, multiple scenario. The second set of images were focusing on navigating the colonial infrastructure that was placed in the city, whether it's crossing one of those uh, checkpoints that we talked about or having to, to um, maneuver it through different places and through different limitations. And the third looked at what I called counter-colonial tactics, which were found in everyday actions that the Hebronites had done, from making soup every day for lunch, um, to exposing the story of your Israeli settler neighbor and telling me about it, to keeping alive traditional handcrafts work, which is what we see in the third image, to finally documenting and rehabilitating the historic city. Uh, these actions were really reminders of their steadfastness, the steadfastness and the resistance of the colonial powers that kind of attempted to erase them. This kind of video and photographic process, as I said, was neither static nor purely documentary. What I wanted to do is I began to take some of those images and still images and be, try to kind of 
do a, 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 a transitional kind of experimentation on them, sometimes of further transformations, highlighting some of the significant things I saw. So one of the examples here, and I won't take too long about talking about it, but we can maybe talk later, is an image that I saw while helping documenting Al-Haram al-Ibrahimi, where here what we see is a bullet hole that's literally just next to some of the ornamentation in, in the, inside the haram. The bullet hole is from, um, uh, is from uh, a bullet uh, from the shooting that happened in the Ibrahimi Mosque, where an Israeli settler came into the Ibrahimi Mosque and uh, killed uh, a group of uh, Palestinian Muslims worshiping in the mosque. The way that the bullet hole is patched versus the way that the, the screen is regilded are quite different. This is done hastily, it's done with, uh, with, uh, with uh, no care, whereas the regilding that's done by the HRC is done with thoughtfulness. And I wanted to be able to kind of juxtapose those and understand what those mean, to see in a way the colonial and the counter, the, the, the violence and its care, and how those kind of exist literally next to each other in the site. Another image, which is an image that you just saw in the beginning, was this idea of, again, understanding that the immediacy of the colonial project with understanding that the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian family living in the bottom versus the Israeli settlers that are living on the top. I use that image to, to further kind of iterate on it and work on it, trying to understand as well larger um, questions that were happening in Palestine and in Hebron more specifically, questions of archaeological digs that are limited to Palestinians but are open for Israelis to be able to access different narratives and different uh, uh, produce different uh, kind of um, arguments for themselves, but as well going up to so the underground, but as well going to above the ground with some of the soldiers that you see on the rooftops, some of the cameras and surveillance that you see in Hebron. But I wanted to make sure that this wasn't necessarily a story of the colonial power, that this also wanted to emphasize the Palestinian presence. And this was really about the Palestinian counter. So, what I looked at then is really kind of seeing the, Hebron, the Hebronite family, the camera that the family put on their back door, trying to capture and make sure, making sure that they're protecting themselves from the Israeli settler. So a camera against the camera in a way. And then uh, what we see on the top is that woman who's climbing over the rooftop to be able to access her own home. The second action, which was really about imagining the unknown or the map, was really about trying to understand those areas that I wasn't able to access. So in Palestine and under the gaze of the Israeli colonial surveillance system, my identity as a Palestinian citizen is disqualified. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, my identity as a Palestinian citizen disqualifies my Canadian citizenship. So in a way, in, in, in Hebron, I'm only seen as a Palestinian. And even though I carry a Canadian passport and a Canadian citizenship, that doesn't give me any foreigner privileges. I'm only seen as a Palestinian. So that's why that Shuhada Street, as an example, I wasn't able to access. Um, so that means that really a lot of the moments, my access has been always drastically uh, constrained, reduced, and always kind of uh, dissected. So what I wanted to do is really be able to employ counter mapping, which is also quite a common theory, as an iterative process here to be able to resist the attempts that were done to disorient, confuse, and dissolve the fullness of the city and the reality on the ground. By this, I mean that the map I drew was constantly always changing, always transforming, bringing into light really more vivid understanding of my personal experiences. So that always used to happen because while I was doing uh, field work for the HRC, luckily, which I didn't know would happen, I was able to get access to the minarets of the mosques as a way to document the heritage of the mosques. So, Climbing up the minarets, I was able to have a little bit more of a bird's eye view, something which none of the maps was able to give me. So that bird's eye view helped me understand some of those areas that are completely restricted and I haven't been able to see ever since I started doing my research. What that also allowed me to do is start to kind of try to draw the map, try to understand the map, but then draw it with the residents or with some of the members of the HRC of the Haven Rehabilitation Committee and allow them to redraw the map with me or to kind of annotate the map or edit the map. It really kind of questioned the, the fullness and the finished sense of a map, a map being this finality, being this, um, I would say, concrete thing, and allowed the map to be a tool of learning rather than a way to actually kind of have a, a final 
uh, finality as well. And then finally, the last um, act was really what I call marking the wound or the rubbing. During my field visits in 2019, I really began to notice the vividness of the various architectural textures and surfaces, and I decided to document those using charcoal rubbings as a way to expand the, the nature of mapping and, and the mapping exercise to something that's a bit more slow burn, something that takes time, that's ritualistic, that I do it and it opens conversations and open relationships. So as I did it, it started becoming something that was quite full, in a way full. I would do the rubbing and I made it an exercise to myself that at least I would do one rubbing per day. Regardless of where it was, it wasn't necessarily about the rubbing, it was about what the rubbing was going to do. And every time I did a rubbing, it opened curiosities for the people around me, right? A researcher, a Palestinian, doing this really odd exercise, doing this thing that they've never seen before, people would come and talk to me. And it opened, it was really a, a welcoming to be able to talk to each other, to learn from each other without having that power dynamic being a researcher and a subject, right? It allowed us to be Palestinians doing work together. And that's exactly what I did. Here, I was doing, again, field work with the HRC for their UNESCO documentation. And I did a rubbing while we're in the house. The girl saw me. She asked me what I was doing. I explained it to her. She took me to a room in her house where the word Allah, God, was itched into the wall, asking me, hey, can I do a rubbing there? I said, yes, of course. She did the rubbing there. It created familiarity and created softness. It created kind of intimacy. That opened the conversation with the whole family. Her brother ended up taking me up to their roof, showing me the surveillance camera that's put on their roof by the Israeli settlers. As we talked about it, we were standing there talking about the camera, what the camera did, when the, or sorry, by the Israeli soldiers who put the camera on the top. As we talked about it, where he was also explaining to me how the Israeli soldiers sometimes sit on the roof of their house, having this conversation, the camera just goes and shifts and starts looking at us. And I start to also start understanding a lot more this question of surveillance and what is happening there and how every moment is really being captured and every moment you're really under someone's gaze and someone is looking at your work. So what the rubbings did is I was able to kind of trace them and understand them as moments where conversations happened, as moments where I was able to have uh, observations, where I was able to learn something new. It was really a marker, and that's why I called it marking the wound. It was really a marker to be able to understand some of the areas that were either eliminated through the blurness of the map or either removed through the censorship that we saw with the narratives that have been removed. So those, uh, those uh, rubbings I then geolocated on that on that map that's been, that's, been, um, that's been blurred to be able to understand kind of their locations, what they do, and as a way to kind of maybe question some of the limitations um, and to become really physical markers of those counter-colonial na narratives. I was able to then find relationships with them, trying to understand what those markers are. So I was, I was able to signify really three important ideas. One of them was really about um, looking at the infrastructure and the work that's done um, in Hebron in, in a way to be able to, uh, uh, to take care and manage the site in what I then started calling counter-governance. The other one is documenting the Israeli opposition on the site and what I started looking at in what I call counter-evidence. And then finally, the last one was about heritage rehabilitation and the work that the HRC does in what I started calling counter-heritage. So those actually became the drivers for my research. And it was really important to understand that I didn't necessarily go into my site with any theory, with any approach, with any specific method as well, rather than just saying, I want to go and learn. And it was really all those things that slowly helped me understand, even though as a Palestinian who has massive knowledge of the site, still not going in with any kind of already preconceived ideas, going in, being open, curious, and really wanting to learn from the site there. So all in all, the documentation process and the mapping techniques used became generative processes where the map is a tool to discover and investigate rather than a tool to illustrate, which was a really great way to kind of start understanding the site. And again, just to kind of highlight, those ended up creating those three counter-colonial ideas that I looked at in HRC, the counter-governance, the counter-heritage, and the counter-evidence. I'm not going to talk about, about those too much, but we can, we can have a conversation in the end. And just to finish up, I just want to finish by kind of talking a little bit about um, 
what are the things in terms of spatial that you see in Hebron? And really, where does the counter-colonial kind of live in Hebron? Because I know that might be something that's interesting. So I want to talk a little bit more about HRC's work. HRC really has been able to expand um, from being just a build heritage and conservation and uh, 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 project to a place that really does multiple things. While HRC's main task is really to be able to preserve the city, what they really are trying to do is repopulate the city, understanding that by bringing Palestinians back to the site, they're protecting the site. So all their work is not necessarily just about establishing uh, a, a conservation project where you would just maintain and take care and preserve a building, not necessarily just looking at the building for its building per se, for its material, but understanding that the building could be an agent in that project of resistance, understanding that the building can be a place where people can start using, people can be able to actually, again, counter the herbicide, be able to bring in life back to the city that's been trying, that people are, or the Israelis are trying to kill in a way. Uh, so looking at some of the examples, this is one of the first examples that I want to talk about really fast. This is Al-Amr School, which is a, a project that the HRC did an adaptive reuse project in, if you want to look at it in an architectural point of view. But more significantly, it was a project that was a housing project that was originally uh, owned by a set of families. Together, they talked to the families, tried to make sure... It, got their approval to be able to use the to, to use the area and did a project for it as change it into a school. Why it was really important that it became a school? Because in Al Shuhada Street, the street where Palestinians can access, can't access, there's three schools. Since the area was closed, the school's attendance dropped by 50% because students couldn't go to those areas. So it was really important to be able to establish a new school to be able to actually allow for Palestinians, and especially still Palestinians' youth, to actually have a good education. The other option would have been either for Palestinians, for students to be able to have to go somewhere quite far, or for the families to actually move away from those areas. Another project which, I've, which you've seen before is the, the playground that, that was done. So the playground is, was, was made into one of the most restricted areas in Hebron. It's an area where Palestinians are allowed to access by foot, but not by car. So again, still another layer of kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, governance and of, of uh, division. Uh, and it was really important to be able to create a space where children can feel safe, that children can feel that they can use the space and actually be able to feel like there's a space for them to, to be able to grow in. Just recently in 2021, the HRC opened the old Hebron Museum as again, another adaptive reuse project from a historic building that was built in 1943 called Hotel Palestine. It's really important to, as well to kind of look at the history of the building. Hotel Palestine was one of, the, one of the first hotels to open in Hebron, and it was significant because it really signified the economic and touristic culture that was happening in Hebron as this really big thriving city that was happening, again, 1943, before the creation of the Israeli state, right? So again, the culture that was existing at that time. The museum, most importantly, overlooks an Israeli settlement just across of it. So if you look from here, from the balcony, you see that Israeli settlement over there. So what the museum does is that it allows you to literally see the colonial project right in your face as you enter the museum and you look into what the museum is offering. Specifically speaking, and I talked about this in, in the afternoon or in the at noon with some of the students, is this balcony over here. The only balcony that the museum has the balcony is connected to a room that uh, has been organized to talk about the political context in Hebron. So you go and you learn about the political context. And the, the next thing you do is you literally step out into the balcony. And as you step out, what you see is that Israeli settlement. So literally, the, 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 the political condition is placed right in your face. And it's a way to actually expose it for what it is, for the violence that it is. So it is through these different rehabilitation and conservation projects that the city continues to survive, at least in the areas where it's allowed to do so. These images are from Al Qasaba Street, the first street that we looked at, where Palestinians are still allowed to exist. Uh, it, what it does, it offers, offers a glimpse of what the area could be and what the area used to be as well. Within the street and the adjacent alleyways, Palestinians' tradition, culture, uh, remain with handiwork, hand social activities, and community work. 
through glass growing, pottery, sewing, communal meals, and much, much more, the, the city continues to thrive. In El Shuhada Street, specifically, which is, again, the street that's close to Palestinians, Palestinian activists once a year host a protest called Open Al Shuhada Street that demands the reopening of the street. And one of the most significant examples is the traditions that we can see here in El Taqiyya Al Ibrahimiyya, which is a place that's a hospice where soup is offered to the community once a day throughout the year. It's a tradition that is believed to have existed historically over time and that continues to exist nowadays. Throughout history, the taqiyya really functioned as a place of rest and again, a soup kitchen that provides free meals to the poor throughout the whole day. This tradition of offering food has continued to thrive until today and serves about, we're talking about around 2,000 families per week. As the families walk to the taqiyya, every day their presence literally fills the street. I wanna highlight a couple of images of the children as they walk to grab the soup. One of them you see here is literally holding the bucket and actually is making noise and like making music as he walks to grab the soup. This is filling the city with life, right? These are the actions that we assume as everyday actions, as actions of survival, but they're much more than that. They're tactics, they're intentional. They understand the colonial project that they've been placed in and they're countering it through everyday quite specific actions, right? These have been quite successful, so what we see Looking at HRC's attempts, we can see that the population of Palestinians, while it has decreased from 1950s up until uh, when the settlements were, were, were starting to be built in the 1970s, and again, there was a big decrease when the massacre happened inside uh, the Ibrahimi Mosque, that population is still slowly starting to increase. So by 2015, we have around 6,500 Palestinians living in the old city again. So the work is happening. There is hope that uh, the, the, the population is increasing and that really the, 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 I would say the urban conditions and the urbanity are coming back to the old city. So what we can see is that despite the colonial powers that attempt to demoralize the people, segregate the city and destroy the sense of community, Palestinians, including myself as a Palestinian researcher, counter. They counter through everyday actions, through resiliency, through tactics and forceful strategies. In all of this, it is the Palestinian hope that continues to advance the cause and give momentum to our struggle. Thank you very much.